Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say I'm here with Peter Klein. He's a professor at Baylor University and the author of, of this book, uh, Why Managers Matter, The Perils of the Bossless Company, which I'm so excited to get into today because as I was explaining to Peter before we came on, I've been something of a fanboy of all of the companies who claim to vary to greater or lesser degrees to be bossless have, have featured on this podcast. I've been very enthusiastic about some of the processes I've learned about at those companies. And so, I mean, it's just been great to read the book, to hear some, something of the counter argument. Uh, so yeah, really excited to have you here today, Peter. Richard, thanks so much for having me on. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, so am I. And for, for the benefit of our of our listeners, could you give us a a, a potted history to to Peter Klein and how you <laughs> came to be where where you're at right now? Well, it's good sure. to get some background. Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, in higher education for several decades. Uh, I'm trained as an economist, so that uh, that's either a feature or a bug, depending on one's orientation. Uh, and I I, um, I study firms and industries and competition. And more recently, I've gotten into the entrepreneurship and innovation space quite a bit more. So actually, my academic unit at Baylor University is in the Department of Entrepreneurship and Corporate Innovation. So I teach undergraduate and graduate courses in you know how how entrepreneurs and managers can organize themselves, can organize their companies to be more innovative to create more value, uh, which leads to sort of an interesting, uh, you know, question of wh why, why write a book on management? And it's partly because um, my, my colleague, who's a professor at Copenhagen Business School in Denmark, my co-author on this book, he and I both have been very interested in organizational design. I'm coming at it more from the entrepreneurship and innovation angle. And, you know, gosh, the, the sorts of companies that you mentioned before and that we talk about on the book, they're so well known for not only being highly innovative, but also having a very unique kind of structure and design. And we thought we wanted to explore that intersection uh, a little bit more more carefully. Right. Yes. And uh, yeah. And there's the poster children, if you like, the, the Zappos, you know, the, the Valve, uh, the Morning Star. You know, we, we've had shows dedicated to, to all of those. Holacracy as a as a practice that we've had uh, Brian Robinson on. So so. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's great that you've you, you've taken a, a look at a look at that. Um, well, and I, I wonder if just yeah, for people who are just coming to this this podcast for the first time and maybe aren't familiar with uh, with those companies, is it worth as you do in the part one of the book, just lay out what we mean by the bossless company and you know what it is? I guess we're we're holding up to examine. Sure. I, I mean, I should state at the outset that the term bossless company is a slightly hyperbolic, slightly exaggerated label for firms that have an extremely flat organizational structure, right? Very few or no layers of middle management, a high level of worker empowerment, uh, meaning a lot of autonomy delegated to employees, you know, very little constraint or supervision from above. Now, these are not literally bossless companies in, in almost all cases. We, mm. we can get into things like worker co-ops and so forth uh, later on. But the firms that you just mentioned, these are not cooperatives. I mean, these are these are for-profit commercial ventures. They do have owners. They do have some senior management. They have a board of directors. But they're really, really, really flat. They have very, very flat structures. Now, you know, as academics trying to make a, a rhetorical point, and of course, as authors wanting to sell lots of copies of books, we you know we wanted to sort of be deliberately provocative and say, well, gosh, this trend towards the bossless company, uh, you know, it, it needs a little bit of further discussion. And maybe it isn't all it's cracked out to be. Now, in our defense, the concept of the bossless company is not something we invented. Some of the most evangelical proponents of radically flat organizational structures have used this language, and sometimes they use it somewhat metaphorically. You know, it's it's uh, organizations work best when everyone is empowered to be his own boss or her own boss. They don't literally mean everyone is a proprietor in the legal sense, but they mean it's almost as if you're sort of running your own show. 
So we pick up on that terminology. We call it the bossless company narrative. The narrative is the view that this radically decentralized, extremely flat, almost bossless structure is the best for everyone. That that's the structure that all companies or almost all companies in all industries, in all environments, in all countries, with all technologies, et cetera, ought to embrace. And so, of course, we're challenging the narrative that flatter is always better. And what we argue, we'll get into this, you know, now is, is you know, flatter has some advantages and, and can be the right move in some circumstances, but it isn't a panacea and there are no one size fits all solutions in business on any margin. Right. Um, good. And, and maybe, I mean, in some of the senses, that's the punchline of, of, of the book, isn't it? And, um, but, but I wonder if we start to to look at what you found when you sort of you went under the hood, so to speak, of, of some of these bossless companies, um, you know, that I'm now very familiar with. Uh, so that's, that's that was interesting to me to read it and might be interesting for people to learn, you know, what are the, the downsides sure, of some of these sure. cultures? Yeah. So one of the things that we found, so the first part of the book sort of lays out this narrative as I've as mm. I've described it. We provide lots of examples from the business press and uh, consultants and gurus and so forth making this argument that flatter structures you know have these sort of universal qualities that uh, such that they're advantageous almost all of the time some of those gurus are themselves ceos or founders of companies that have embraced a radically flat, flat structure some are professors or authors or consultants you know people like gary hamill for example is a well-known proponent of this narrative so w- we lay out what the narrative is and then we begin to look a little bit under the hood at some possible, you know, what do these companies really do? When you look more closely, what do you find? Well, we argue that um, the landscape uh, 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 is is a lot more, a little bit more complicated than the way it's conventionally described. So there are some companies, Morningstar is a good example of a company that really, you know, really talks the, sorry, really walks the walk and has, in fact, embraced a radically, uh, a unique kind of a structure. And you say, you, you, I know you've discussed Morningstar. Two, two people, two X. Fantastic. Uh, so, I mean, please. the way that Morningstar is described, you know, this model where employees are sort of continually negotiating and renegotiating lateral agreements among participants, coordinating things in a very bottom-up manner. I mean, Morningstar really does work that way. However. Other ostensibly bossless companies are not, in fact, bossless at all. Either they embrace what sort of appears superficially to be a radically new structure, but it's more marketing and labeling. An example we use in the book is Spotify, which has become well known for this, uh, you know, sort of idiosyncratic model where they have um, employees organized into what they call squads, and mm. then squads can be combined into tribes and there are tr- chapters within tribes, and tribes can form alliances and so forth. We argue that Spotify really embraces a fairly mundane and conventional organizational structure, which in business schools for decades we've been calling the matrix form. So some some supposedly or ostensibly bossless companies are just repackaged or PR-enhanced versions of fairly conventional structures. We say that other um ostensibly bossless companies you know like uh, um zappos would be a good example or maybe valve they do in fact at a formal level have an extremely egalitarian flat sort of a model but the way they have tended to operate in practice is one with a good deal of hierarchy almost a sort of a conventionally um operating hierarchy but just without the formal titles so there's often de facto hierarchy where there isn't, you know, sort of de jure or statutory or formal hierarchy. I, I think you said uh, when we were chatting earlier that you had also discussed Valve. Yeah, other- I mean, in fact, when I read their, hand, their handbook, it was like, I still remember first reading it and, you know, wide eyed. and You know, I'm thinking, this sounds wow, great. This, <laughs> this yeah, I mean, you know, the, sort of the, utopia the, here. <laughs> I mean, the, the dark side of Valve, as, as I'm sure you've also discussed, is you know, a, a lot of you know former Valve employees say, 
this may have more resonance to American listeners than to uh, British listeners. They say it was it was it's it worked more like a high school, you know, mm. in high school, typical American high school. And even those who haven't uh, experienced it have probably seen plenty of Hollywood films, yeah. you know, coming of age teenager films. There, there are a lot of power structures in place. You know, there are the cool kids who actually run the school. There are, you know, the nerds or other kids who get picked on and sort of bossed around. There are all these different sort of different subcultures and different subgroups, which, in fact, exercise a lot of authority, even though on paper, everyone's the same. So we found that in other cases, even where there really is sort of formally a fairly bossless structure in place, that's not how things actually work in practice. In practice, there are certain individuals, teams, groups who may not have a formal managerial title, but really act like a middle manager, even though in, you know we're told that middle managers you know, aren't present there. Um, one, one final thing that we observed, and this actually came out of a, a different study that we did, but we, we, we report it in the book, is um, even companies that have, in reality, embraced, em, embraced and implemented a flatter structure, uh, have found that that flatness does not always result in more worker empowerment. Hmm. So we did a study of uh, a, a European companies looking at the adoption of certain kinds of information technology, you know, that allow for um, more direct flows of information between senior management and employees. So now, you know, we all have uh, in, in an IT enabled organization, senior management has, you know, access to a bunch of dashboards or they can, you know, they have much, much, uh, much closer eyes on the ground than they would have, you know, with previous sorts of communications technologies and structures in place. And so one of part of the narrative is, okay, well, now we can get rid of some of those intermediaries, some of those middle managers whose job was to help direct flows of information up and down. Now we can do that directly uh, through technology. We can, we can get rid of these middle layers. Well, what we found is in companies that had delayered for that reason, Senior managers reported that when they reflected on what they did in a typical day, they were actually micromanaging even more than they did before. Right? They were they were they were intervening more frequently in lower level operations than they had with the previous structure. And we we quote in the book uh, sort of a, an infamous comment from Elon Musk. Uh, there was an email that he sent to Tesla employees. That, much discussed about organizational structure, uh, where essentially he said, you know, Tesla is designed so that anyone in the organization can speak directly to anyone else. There's no need to go through an intermediary. You know, the implication being, if you're, you know, on the shop room floor at a Tesla assembly plant and you have an urgent need to speak to the CEO, you know, you can you can talk directly to Elon Musk without having to go through an intermediary. Isn't that great? Isn't that empowering? Well, I mean, yeah, it is in some way. But think think about imagine that you are that shop room that employee on the on the shop room floor. Not only are you one phone call or one email away from away from Elon Musk, Elon Musk is now one phone call or one email away from you, <laughs> and you may not like the thought. <laughs> That Elon Musk is looking at you through a camera mm. or, you know, tracking you through data analytics to see exactly what you're doing during the day and, you know, offering some helpful suggestions. So delayering can sometimes mean that senior managers intervene even more rather than less. So those are some of the ways in which we tried to look in more detail at how bossless companies or ostensibly bossless companies actually operate. And we found sometimes they really aren't bossless. Sometimes they are bossless, but there are power structures de facto. And sometimes we found that streamlining and flattening does not actually empower workers. Mm. And and what did you discover from a, a business performance perspective? Did you did you see that they were these companies, you know, regardless of the reality, but the, the companies that at least purport to be bossless, are they more or, or you know productive or innovative or profitable? Did you find anything? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, is a big 
emphasis area for academic research in business, like in any field, right, is, is being very careful doing empirical analysis, you know, not to set up the study to get the results that you want. You know, we've seen this in debates, I don't know, debates about COVID and lockdowns, for example, mm -hmm. you know, people want to show that lockdowns were good or lockdowns were bad. And, you know, they, they, they show you a chart, but they choose the starting date and the ending date, you know, so you only see the part of the chart that reinforces the, the argument yeah. the person is trying to make. Um, we want to be very careful in doing empirical studies, you know, that we're not just sort of cherry picking a few examples. So we argue that the sort of bossless company literature, the narrative, as I've described it, tends to, you know, over rely on cherry picked anecdotes. So, you know, one of these, a, a few of these poster children are described Sometimes pro performance data is shared, but only for, you know, a couple of years. And gee, it, it turns out that they happen to pick the couple of years when the when performance was really high. If you look more holistically at a broad set of flatter organizations and you look over a long period of time, you don't see any systematic relationship, certainly no positive relationship between the degree of flatness, the degree of empowerment, the degree of bosslessness. And the sort of conventional measures of financial performance, growth, and so forth. So a lot of companies have been very, uh, some of these flat companies were very successful for a period of time. Uh, a less well-known example, because it's from Latin America and it's uh, not as well-known today as it was before, is Semco, which is a Brazilian conglomerate founded by a guy named Richard Semler. Uh, or uh, it became famous under the leadership of Semler. I think he was the son of the founder. Uh, back in the 1960s and 1970s, and this was, the, you know, on the front page of HBR and Fortune magazine, and everyone was talking about how great this company was. It was it one was of the books that got me first interested in management. You know, that's a, yeah. So yeah. I mean, it's a fascinating example. Mm. But similar, basically, I mean, uh, it, it didn't go bankrupt. But um, uh, sorry, Semco, Semler's model at Semco was eventually abandoned when the company ran into performance problems. Oticon, the Danish hearing aid company, which is not as well known to North American uh, listeners as, as Europeans, uh, also experimented with a, a very sort of innovative and flat structure, but, but abandoned it after less than 10 years and went back to what it has now, which is a more conventional managerial hierarchy. You know, Valve is a super interesting case because... Um, you know, while Valve continues to be a pretty flat company, as described in the handbook that you mentioned before, uh, Valve has really changed its business model. I mean, Valve is not a producer of software, of video games anymore. Valve is a platform distributor of games. And so there was a mismatch between, you know, the business model and the organizational structure. And in some of these cases, that mismatch was addressed by reverting to more of a conventional organizational structure. In other cases, like Valve, it was addressed by changing to a different business model that was a better match for the radically flat structure. So to make a long story short, we think there, uh, we could not find compelling evidence that flatter structures, you know, consistently, systematically yield higher performance than more conventional structures, though obviously there are a few examples of specific firms at specific times, or in Morningstar's case, across a broad, you know, at a lot of times, that actually perform quite well. Interesting. And then, and, and in terms of employee satisfaction or employee happiness, I mean, because that's, I mean, certainly that's why I have an interest in these structures as, as potential vehicles to improve general levels of well-being and happiness in the workplace. Uh, is, have you, was there any data on that that you looked at? Yeah, there, there is some data. I don't think we have super comprehensive sort of systematic evidence across lots of companies, lots of industries. But there's plenty of anecdotal evidence to be sure that, that workers, not all workers, but some workers respond very positively to high levels of empowerment. I mean, you know, there's sort of indirect evidence from the organizational economics and organizational design literatures going back many decades that, sure, I mean, if you want to improve um, employee effort on the job, you know, 
some some more delegation of authority combined with incentive based compensation tends to yield higher levels of performance sometimes it also yields higher levels of self reported satisfaction but not all i mean it's, you know the old story of i don't know in retail you know commission versus salaries right so um if you want to motivate people in sales to put forth, you know, high levels of effort, constraining them with a lots of rules and policies and procedures and paying them a fixed salary is not going to yield a very dynamic entrepreneurial sort of level of effort. Performance-based pay combined with delegation of authority, you know, i.e. more autonomy and stronger rewards for autonomy will certainly induce on average changes in behavior. But even there, I mean, look, uh, my uh, my late father-in-law was a very successful uh, real estate developer, and he could sell property. Oh, that man could sell. He sold a lot of things during his career, and he was an expert in, you know, painting a picture of what the customer's life will be like after the sale has been made. Um he in almost all of his sales related functions he insisted on being paid you know at a, on a 100% commission basis that's how that's what made him tick that's mm. what it felt enabling to him and that's what allowed him to be highly financially successful um in contrast let's look at your distinguished guest on today's podcast um i myself you know i study entrepreneurship i i teach entrepreneurship I am not myself an entrepreneur as my primary occupation. I mean, I do a little bit of entrepreneurship on the side, you know, consulting and so forth. But my primary, uh, my day job is as a tenured professor at a university, which is about the most bureaucratic, you know, thing that you can imagine. Now, I do have a lot of autonomy, you know, in the classroom, but you know, short of uh, committing a heinous crime, it's very unlikely that I will ever lose my job or have a substantial, you know, pay cut. Now, I won't get a huge pay increase either. Mm. So I'm almost like a government bureaucrat. I mean, I'm like a salaried, mm. tenured civil servant. That sounds like the least entrepreneurial thing that any human being could be. Why don't I quit? And I have some friends uh, who are interested in the same topics as uh, as I am. They said, oh, I'm sick of working in a big bureaucracy, universities are terrible, I'm going to quit and I'm going to go out on my own. And I could do that. I could be a best-selling author and, you know, uh, live live the high life, you know, giving speeches and writing books. I don't want that. I don't I don't enjoy that. That doesn't make me tick. Mm. I prefer the safety and security of my teaching position and I can dabble in writing books and appearing on wonderful podcasts like yours, but that's not how I make my living. Now, mm. which of those personality types is the best one? Obviously, you know, there's no one model that works for everyone. Richard, what I'm getting at is um, I think it is sometimes mistakenly assumed in these conversations that, that, that we're having that a more empowered work for, workplace is always... Um, you know that it that it improves everyone's well-being but there may be some employees who would prefer a little bit less responsibility less pressure to make so many decisions to have so much control some employees obviously nobody wants to be treated like cattle right nobody wants to be a, a mere cog mm -hmm. in the machine that, that's not good for anyone but subject you know there's a certain level of empowerment and satisfaction and feelings of self-worth that we all want in the workplace. But that doesn't correspond with having full control over my own budget and, you know, being paid a, 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 on a commission and not having anyone that I report to or having almost, you know, having fewer layers of, of reporting. Maybe I actually would feel more empowered with a bit more structure and I'd like it if a middle manager would take away some of the decisions that in an empowered workforce, fully empowered workplace, I have to make every day. So again, people are different. People have different preferences. They have different temperaments. They have different personalities subject to being treated with appropriate dignity and respect. I don't think it's the case that everyone is better off 
with more empowerment than with compared to less. Yeah, and that's really interesting. And and it, and it, it yeah certainly stands against the narrative, which to some extent I've bought into. Of you know we're all collectively evolving, right? As a, as a society, including our, which includes of course our business practice, which is providing ever more autonomy for individuals. And there's this kind of notion of us uh, you know, evolving in consciousness and, and becoming kind of you know, more enlightened beings where we, we don't have a need for all these structures and these bosses and we'll, we all become freer and happier as a result. And it sounds to me like you've got, you've got quite a different you know, narrative. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, I, I don't think that, that broader question, that's not one that we can easily answer using the you know, data and theories and so forth that we have. That may be true, but I, I think... Um, you know, if, if if a general societal trend like that is taking place, it's taking place in the background and not at a level at which we can easily measure it. And, and you know, what implications does that have for the workforce? In, in your defense, right, we have a lot of surveys of attitudes across generations. And another part of the narrative is that, oh, the old, you know, 1950s era workplace, and we use, you know, some examples in the book of what we think that looks like from popular culture, cinema, whatever, you know, Mad Men, the Mad Men style office mm. uh, that may have been OK for for boomers or uh, even Gen Xers or whatever. But for millennials, Gen Zs and whatever is coming after Gen Z, that kind of rigid, structured environment just isn't going to work. Um, also, you know, post covid, people are used to working from home and having more control over their schedule and wearing, you know, blue jeans or shorts or whatever, or pajamas, you know, to, to work while they're on a Zoom call. Um, yeah, so there's certainly no turning back the clock. And and we're not going to go back to the broader societal culture of previous generations, maybe that was more conservative, not politically conservative, but, you know, mm. more sort of conventional and traditional. I think there's there's no doubt that those trends are real and important. And employers certainly need to take into account the requirements and preferences of today's workers. Though, again, you know, what explains so-called quiet quitting? What explains why, you know, people my age are always complaining about Gen Zs and millennials, oh, they don't work hard, they don't show up on time, they don't have the same um, ethos, uh, you know, re related to work that, that we had and our parents had and so forth. Um, you know, it, it may be that... Um, that younger workers would actually benefit from a little bit more structure to the job. Again, to sort of echo the point that I made before, that maybe, you know, uh, expecting people to be self-starters and to be sort of, you know, self-governing, maybe we overplay that a little bit. And maybe some of the frustration that younger workers are feeling on the job is feeling that, well, they don't really know what they're supposed to do. They don't have enough guidance. They don't have enough coaching. They don't, again, nobody wants to be, like I said before, you know, nobody wants the hammer to come down on them. You don't want an aggressive boss, but maybe you want coaching, you want mentoring. It, it, let, let me take this opportunity to sort of uh, uh, seg into another issue that's an important part of this uh, of our book, especially in the, in the second half, is, you know, it, it is it is useful to sort of rethink what authority and hierarchy really mean you know, in the modern world, because most people think of the, the way you exercise authority is by telling people what to do. Hmm. Command and control, you know, the military commander barking out orders and people rushing to a, that is one manifestation of authority, but another way that authority is manifest increasingly. So in our modern world is through the sort of design and implementation of systems and processes within which empowered employees can make choices and can exercise responsibility and so forth. So maybe we've erred on the side of allowing the autonomy and responsibility, but not providing the structure, not providing the rules of the game, not providing the coaching and mentoring to help people be successful. You know, that is also necessary for that empowered uh, community to be successful. Yeah, I like, and I think I suppose you're referring it to the the Mark One and the Mark Two authority, which I yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we call it. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like that that framing of it, uh, and that did make some sense to me. And um, I'd be interested in there is that is there data to suggest that part of the malaise in the workplace is people feeling like there isn't enough structure or guidance or 
you know, is did you see any of that? It, you know, is there any data to back that up? Yeah. So, I mean, th there's plenty of anecdotal evidence for this. Right. I have not seen a systematic survey that exactly asks asks the question in the way that we could elicit that particular uh, set of responses. So I can't say conclusively that that's part of what lies behind, you know, quiet quitting and so forth. It's my conjecture that at least part of the explanation is that the pendulum has swung too far, you know, kind of the, the opposite direction. But I can't, I can't prove that at least as of today. Well, okay. Yeah. But the, the that sounds like a you know a reasonable hypothesis to me that that you know perhaps that is the case and and for people like me who have very high preferences for autonomy and freedom and so on um even the potentially to uh to the detriment of my finances as you elicit right. in the back but right, entrepreneurs make what is it 35 percent less over their career right. than, <laughs> yes. and I, I sometimes yeah. see some of my uh colleagues who've Played by the rules and stuck in big corporates who, you know, probably made uh, more money over their uh, careers than I have. But, you know, Richard, th that's a really important point that you made, and I was hoping to to, to get to mm. it. That, I mean, we have to ask why are people organized into these formal groups to begin with, right? So, so well, you know, my dream is to I, I want to be employed by company X, right? Um, but I want to be my own man, my own woman. I want to have lots of empowerment and so forth. Okay, well, if you really want full autonomy and empowerment, you should not be an employee of a company in the first place. You should be a proprietor. You should be an entrepreneur. You should you should you should start and run your own enterprise, which is great. I mean, I'm a huge supporter of entrepreneurship. However, it isn't the case that um, you know all goods and services are most efficiently produced. In smaller, you know, in a in, in smaller, younger startup companies, right? There are plenty of good reasons why some existing, more mature, large, complicated organizations, you know, do what they do and do what they do well. So the mere fact that people are organizing themselves into these units, you know, we could look and we talk a little bit, you know, more broadly in the book, you know, families, communities, um, uh, you know, churches, clubs, and of course, companies, firms, right? The, the reason that people organize into these groups is because, you know, sometimes to, to accomplish the objectives that we want, we need to team up and we need to make sure that what the, the you know, the teamwork is well coordinated. We need to manage the cooperation among team members in a way that is most effective at allowing us to accomplish our goals. Now, sometimes that coordination can take place through the market. I'm a big proponent of free markets and you know market-based solutions to problems. And so sometimes, you know, the price mechanism, the profit and loss system, you know, is a good way of making sure, you know, th think of an example of, you know, uh during COVID, you know, we're short on uh personal protective equipment, you know, PPE, there's not enough masks, for example. Well, you don't necessarily need a government edict to channel resources into mass product mask production if you have a price system and a market economy right the demand for something like masks is going to go up the market price of masks is going to rise and all sorts of individuals and companies have an incentive to pivot into the production of masks which is exactly what we saw in most countries mm -hmm. you know in 2020 that not only individuals making masks and selling them on Etsy or whatever but you know companies that had expertise in manufacturing other kinds of products paper products you know nylon stockings or whatever quickly retooled into the production of masks because there was demand for masks and you could make more money mm. you could make money selling things that are in high demand so there's an incentive to provide them i mean that's an example now that i think about it maybe not the best example but that's an example of how you can get coordination you know, people need masks, other people make the masks. We can get that done at arm's length. Yeah. We don't need to sit down and have a meeting. We just let prices and the profit and loss mechanism do their thing. We get coordination that way. But, you know, for producing an automobile, whether it's in Henry Ford's day or, uh, you know, Elon Musk's day, it's very difficult to coordinate that at arm's length. You know, uh, in theory, Think about Henry Ford's assembly line. You know, every worker involved in that process could be an independent contractor, mm. owning owning their own tools and equipment. I mean, you could you could have no Ford Motor Company. You could have a network of independent contractors, 
almost like an extreme version of Morningstar, right? Where they negotiate, okay, you, I need this many chassis and I'll give you this many wheels and we'll find this other guy who can bolt them on. I mean, you could do it that way, but the coordination cost is very high. It's more efficient for those people not to be independent contractors, or at least most of them, but to be employees under some central direction and coordination by Henry Ford and his subordinates and so forth. You get things coordinated and working together more smoothly. So, but again, it doesn't mean that every kind of coordination is best affected inside an organization, but probably some of them are. So what I'm saying is if the bossless company narrative were were correct, that this model is always or almost always the best. And if we really followed that through to its logical implication, we shouldn't have business firms at all. I mean, mm. every single adult in the economy should be a self-employed autonomous entrepreneur and all the coordination can take place through negotiations and contracts and so forth. The fact that we don't have that world suggests that there are some reasons why sometimes a little bit more coordinated teamwork works well. Yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. And um, that it's, it's, I suppose what we're, I suppose what we're trying to, I mean, I, I had, so we had a guy who got recently who, who's got an HR platform out of Switzerland and he's used very flat structures in, and he's had various sort of experiments around, um, for example, electing leaders and so on. So, you know, very democratic and, and, he he uh, has come uh, to the conclude. Well, his well, sorry, his his metaphor for where we're at is, and this was interesting, was that we're it's like we're trying to learn to fly. So he really is, I suppose, on one level, sold on the narrative that you know our destiny is a more autonomous future for businesses with more autonomy for people. But we haven't quite figured out exactly what model is going to work. Is it holacracy? You know, is it something like Valve? Right. Uh, is it something like Morningstar? Is it something else? Uh, and and we'd, we'll look back at this period of history as as us kind of trying to figure it out uh, in a in a similar way to perhaps an in industrial revolution. We were trying to figure out you know the best ways of of putting a, a you know, production line together. Let's say, um, and uh, but but now that I you know now that I think about reflect on what you you say, it's not so much that that's our destination. It's that at any period perhaps in time there is going to be a need for highly coordinated hierarchical businesses for certain functions in the economy and we can allow for flatter structures in other parts of the economy but it's not that at any one time any one model is going to be dominant and and yeah work yeah, in all contexts you, uh, you put it extremely well that that's exactly my view and my co-author's view and I'll add in just a second some of the you know some of the contingent factors that might help us to understand why this model works better than that model under these circumstances. But but I also want to make the point that the the, uh, the previous guest you mentioned, you know, maybe may be right that there is a systematic trend in one direction. But I think if you look, if you look over a longer period of history, we've seen these different models kind of waxing and waning. I mean, there there have been periods during the Industrial Revolution for sure. When we saw the emergence, or, or even more recently than that, you know, late 19th century, we saw the emergence of, you know, large vertically integrated enterprises. And then early 20th century, these sort of, you know, multi industry conglomerates. And then there was a little bit of a retrenchment uh, in the post war period. Firms got a little bit leaner. And with AI and, and technology, we're seeing, you know, there are certainly some trends where things move in one direction or another but i don't think the pattern is always or almost always you know going from less hierarchy to more for example in the you know going back to um <clears throat> at least the 17th 18th centuries uh we had the emergence of the worker co-op movement right and we of course we have worker co-ops today we have worker owned cooperatives and we have some customer owned firms and some employee-owned firms, but they're they're relatively rare. Um, you know why? Like so, in in the U.S. and Europe, you see cooperatives largely in a few sectors, like agriculture. There are some, <clears throat> excuse me, farmer-owned processing co-ops in the U.S. There are a few, you know, consumer-owned 
banking and insurance companies. But, but you know, there's, there's no, there are no worker owned manufacturing conglomerates. Mm. Okay. Um, so we might ask why, I mean, why is it that this model of uh, an almost literally bossless organization, which has been available, has been known for a couple of centuries, why has it not proliferated? And it, it, the answer can't be, oh, because, you know, governments crack down on unions and this made co-ops. No, it can't be that because, um, in fact, in most countries, if anything, the, the legal system, the regulatory system, the tax system is favorable towards the cooperative model. There are tax advantages, there's antitrust exemption, there's some subsidies available for co-ops, but we rarely see them form. The reason, and we discuss this in the book, is that co-ops generally work very badly. Um, allowing all the workers to vote on major organizational decisions, gosh, you know, that sounds nice and it might work for a small community club, for a fraternity or something. It doesn't work well for anything but the smallest organizations because um, for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is when when decision makers wear multiple hats, this can make things more complicated, right? We sometimes believe, I think mistakenly, that, oh, well, gosh, if I'm, uh, you know, if I work at the company and I own the company, I'll be a better owner than some absentee, you know, investor in the big city who doesn't know or care anything about our business and our industry. I'll be better positioned to be an owner. Probably it works the other way because if I'm an employee of the company, it's hard for me to make decisions about what's best for the organization as a whole without being biased by my interests as an employee, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be that what's in the, you know, there, there's great growth opportunities or investment opportunities. We need to keep wages low and invest more retained earnings in, you know, R&D or something. In my capacity as a shareholder, as an owner, I might think, yeah, that is the best move for this company to create value. But in my capacity as a wage earning employee, no, of course, I don't want wages to be kept low. I want wages to be higher. I've got these multiple hats, multiple perspectives, which can make it harder for me to be able to sort of see what's the right thing to do. This applies to customers, too. There was a there was a famous old razor blade commercial. I'm sorry, electric razor mm -hmm. commercial. Back when I was a kid, I remember in the U.S., and the, the commercial had the, the spokesperson was the owner of the company. And he's talking about, you know, what a great shave he gets with this razor. And the tagline was, you know, I liked it so much, I bought the company. And we're supposed to think, wow, what a great razor company, because the owner is a guy who's really passionate about razors. That is generally not a good characteristic for a CEO. If you're in love with the product, it can be very hard for you to make difficult decisions. Mm -hmm maybe about getting rid of that product line. Um, so having a clear focus can be an advantage. Who has the clearest focus? Focus, those who care only about, you know, increasing share, share value, right? The, you know, equity owners who are not otherwise connected with the firm often make the best owners. There's also the, the, the problem of how do you, how do you resolve disagreement? So in a worker-owned co-op, you know, you've got to get consensus or you have to vote. And if people are unhappy, you know, that's going to cause frictions and problems. Okay, if you're in the losing faction of the co-op vote and you're really unhappy about what the co-op has decided to do, well, you still work there. You still see the your fellow voters, that, especially the people who voted the wrong way, from your perspective, you see them every day. They're, they're sitting next to you at the next desk or at the next station, you know, in the assembly line. That causes a lot of tension and conflict. If you're an investor and you disagree with the decision that has been made, it's very easy for you to withdraw. You can you can exit, you know, with a couple of mouse clicks on E-Trade. Now you're no longer a decision maker of that firm. You're out. Whereas in a co-op, a partnership, a family firm, it's hard. You can't, you know, you, you, you can never leave or it's very difficult to leave. That leads to more conflict rather than less. So that was a roundabout uh, apologies for mm. you know, it being just acting like a professor here. Um that was a roundabout answer to the question, you know, is there an inexorable trend towards more empowerment and more flatness? Well, if there were, 
then why wouldn't the highly flat model of the cooperative have become the dominant one? It never did. And I think the reason is because sometimes it doesn't work well. And so none of those underlying dynamics are likely to change in the next few decades or centuries, even if we have AI, even if we have, you know, a change in human consciousness or whatever. I don't think these fundamental organizational issues are likely to be very different in the years to come. Right. It reminds me of, a, of a, uh, you cite in the book the, the uh, prehistoric examples from from uh, Graeber and Wengrove, right, of, of human population shifting between different organizational structures. So perhaps this has been going on you know, as long as human society has existed. Could you share a bit on that? Yeah, we, you know, what, what's the old joke that, you know, each generation thinks that it has invented sex? You know, every generation of management thinkers, you know, believes that it's come up with a new model that's never been tried before. But no, they've all been tried under lots of different circumstances. You know, the details are different. You know, the specific technology is different. But when I when I listen today to conversations in the news and popular media about, you know, will AI take lead to unemployment? Are the robots going to take our jobs? You know, this is no different than the discussions, you know, in the early 18th century, you know, when the, the, the Luddites in the UK were, you know, smashing spinning wheels and spinning looms because they said these machines are going to take away our jobs. I mean, the, the, the same issues come up again and again, same fundamentals come up, you know, with slightly different details. I, I did want to mention, you know, we do offer in the book some argument for, you know, specific circ what are the specific circumstances under which flatness works very well tends to work well and we say that flatness tends to be better when the technology when there's a relatively straightforward well understood technology uh when the degree of uncertainty about the market environment is low to moderate and most importantly when the specific roles, tasks, functions, jobs within the group, within the larger group, are highly modular or independent. In other words, where you have a low amount of task and role interdependence, flatness tends to be a better way to organize. For instance, you know, within, within a company like Valve, right, if you have, you know, small groups working on software projects independently, where it isn't necessary that project A, you know, feed into project B and have a certain shape or design or style, well, then there's little need for managerial coordination between A and B. In contrast to like the assembly line, again, it's a little bit of a trope, but I think it helps to make the point that, you know, if you allow too much autonomy on the assembly line, you know, well, the, the guy who is um, putting the chassis together and then sending them down the line to the next guy who, you know, drops the engine into the chassis. And then that assembly, sub-assembly goes down the line and somebody else attaches the wheels or whatever. You know, all the pieces have to fit, you know, from, from a purely engineering point of view, you know, the holes have to, it's like if you've ever, you know, bought some furniture from Ikea or whatever, and, and the holes are not drilled in the right place, you can't put the thing together. It's very frustrating. Everything's got to match up from a technical standpoint to fit one piece to another. There's also kind of temporal coordination. Things have to be going at mm. the right speed. Otherwise, you get a bottleneck or, or there's a, a gap or a shortage. It's very difficult to get all that coordination to take place, at, take, take place at arm's length or through lateral negotiation because you, have, you need very tight coordination. That, that's a, that is a process with a high level of interdependence. Each, you don't get cars unless each, unless each activity is closely matched. And for that, it is often advantageous to have more you know, blueprints, processes, guidance, and sometimes intervention from a middle manager or a senior manager to make sure that all the pieces fit in the way to you know, get, get the product made. So, yeah, and I'm, and now and I'm, I'm real time. I'm going through the examples I've come across and thinking, does that, does that pit, pattern fit? And because when I first read the book and I, I saw the section on 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 Morningstar and you you know making the case that why it worked in that context you know with this very linear linear process without a lot of changing technology and I was thinking yeah but I've interviewed several software firms on this show where they've had very flat structures 
uh, but they probably do conform to your other criterion, which is you know independence of working. And, and most of, if I think about it, they they would tend to have teams that are working on independent pieces of software for clients. It, yeah, they're not they're not needing. I, yeah. I presume they're not needing to coordinate. Um, you know, at scale across the whole the whole company. Yeah, that, that, that's right. That's our argument that what you know you have some shared services. Right, but, but but the specific tasks can largely be carried out without needing to get everybody else in the organization on board. We would call that low interdependence, and that is a scenario where um, uh, a, a flatter structure actually works very well. You still have some coordination within the the small group, right? So everyone in the group is not fully autonomous, but the group doesn't need a lot of central direction because it's largely independent of the other groups. I mean, I, I think that model, you know, we, we do some mini, you know, we provide some case studies in the book, but obviously we haven't studied every single company in every industry in every part of the world. Yeah. So there may be some exceptions to that general rule, but we feel pretty confident as a pattern that, you know, other things equal, uh, the more interdependence, the, the greater the advantages of a little bit more central direction. Yeah, and, but as I think about that, that becomes then to some degree a choice. Okay, so if if you could you could say okay, I, I would prefer to have an organization that's flatter and allows for more in, in empowerment, and so because of that, I'm going to deliberately design the organization in a way that allows for more autonomous units. When I, when I think about Bertolt, where they do that, right? They have these these nursing teams that are, are, are a relative, you know, pretty autonomous, or um, Handel's Banken, right, which again is fairly flat, and each branch has you know, more autonomy than, autonomy, autonomy than a typical branch of, you know, a more centralized bank might. And so to some extent, the two drive each other, right? Your choice of business model will drive to some extent, drive the extent of autonomy you're able to afford your, your employees and vice versa. The more autonomy you give them is going to drive you down a particular sort of business model path. You are absolutely 100% correct. And I, I certainly don't want to leave the impression that you know, we think companies just sort of wake up with a technology, or you wake up with a business model. Oh gosh, now we got to scramble to find the organizational structure that matches. You're absolutely right. Technology, the business model, organizational structure, personnel, right? All of these things are chosen together, maybe maybe simultaneously, or maybe in different sequences at different times. They all have to match up. But we we certainly don't say that you know one is primary over the others. Yeah, you may say, look, given the nature of our workforce, where we're located, the kind of employees we have or want to attract, these, the, these workers really will thrive in a you know, less structured, more autonomous kind of environment. Okay, well, you know, a client pitches a project to us that requires a lot of coordination. We say that's not a good fit for our structure, right? We're going to pass on that one. And we're going to emphasize uh, projects, products, and so forth that are a better match for our structure. So, you know, in a particular case, who knows what, you know, what one may have been, they may have, the firm may have committed to one of these things first for historical reasons and may have committed to another one first. Maybe you're starting with a blank slate. For example, in a startup context, you choose all of the different elements so that they fit well together. That is, again, a major part of our. You know our our sort of no one size fits all solution. You know argument is that it seems like in the bossless company narrative, the claim is being made that you know one element of what a firm does, its organizational structure, is primary. Whatever the technology, whatever the business model, whatever the customer needs, whatever the employee preferences, we start with the assumption that flatter is better, and then we work out the details and everything else. And, and individual autonomy. All of these things have to, yeah, exactly. Well, we think all of these things have to match, and there are lots of different bundles that constitute a good match. Yeah. No, this is this is fascinating. It reminds me we had another <laughs> – oh, you'll notice the theme here. So you had the CEO of another uh, a Finnish company called Vincent, who's uh, – uh, IT services company, and this precisely matches just what we've been talking about. So he was telling the tale that you know, he inherited the company uh, from from the founder in somewhat of a transition phase. So they were famous again for their very flat structures, high levels of individual autonomy, and so on. And he was saying that they are starting to have to make a slight 
shift, right? And having to bring things into more of a centralized structure, they're having to in a little bit more of a sort of a boss culture because they're starting to get customers asking for for global projects, right? They want that, and so that they can't allow their country hubs to have quite the same level of autonomy in order to coordinate for the for the for their global customers. And so that that yeah that and that's causing a you know a culture challenge and so on. And so he's he's obviously navigating all of that, but. What we've just discussed, what makes perfect sense in that context, is he he is now you know needing to to you know weigh up these these various factors as they respond to the, to the new customer demands. Yeah, you know, getting getting all of these different elements to to match up is no easy task, especially when you're starting from a position like in the example that you just d- described. And you know, we in, in my own obviously in writing the book and in my own work with companies working with students and so forth. I mean, we do try to emphasize these are really hard problems, right? And, you know, a lot of careful reflection, weighing different alternatives, thinking carefully about the pros and cons of each option is is obviously, you know, important for making wise decisions. One thing that you often find in the, you know, in the in the business press is like in other areas, there's a little bit of faddishness Right. And sometimes people are quick to jump on a particular bandwagon because it seems like the thing to do. It seems like what everybody else is, you know, uh, what everybody else in the industry or in the market is doing. We don't want to be left out. But again, that can lead to, you know, sort of uh, mistakenly embracing a new trend. And flatness might be one of them. You know, it sounds good on paper, but if you really look more carefully at the details, you may find, gosh, you know, for our particular circumstances, that's going to have some drawbacks that outweigh, you know, the potential advantages. Maybe we need to be a little bit more cautious or let's stick to our guns and see how this all plays out. But you can also see how just the media being what it is and perhaps human nature being what it is, you know, the, that's less likely to catch the headlines, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah, sure. The message is sure. like, well, it all depends and it depends on your context that it might work and it might not. And it, yeah, rather than... You know, let's let's drive. You know, let's let's yeah. kill the bosses. Is, uh, so, yeah, is so we I, I can predict with confidence that uh, despite the extremely high the the extremely high quality of this book, you know, we probably won't sell as many copies as a book with a title like you know, solve your organizational problems with these five steps. Yeah, everybody wants a nice you know kind of self help story, but I mean. Yeah, I, I, I think I think our book appeals to the reader who wants to you know, be a little bit more reflective, and maybe they've read some of these other, you know, kind of other other works in this genre, and I say, gosh, that can it really be that easy? I mean, it's like a you know, it's like diet books or whatever. I mean, will these five simple steps really help me to lose however many pounds or kilos I need to lose? Let me let me try to understand that at a, at, a, at a little bit slightly deeper level, and we hope that we have that, you know that we have provided well, obviously you know in, in a manner that's engaging and entertaining and and hopefully easy to read, uh, you know some food for thought that might encourage people to be a little bit encourage managers to be a little bit more cautious. Yeah. No, and uh, and, and yeah, as I say, I, I love the book, and I'm definitely your your target audience. If people have been drinking the Kool Aid, you know, from some of these other stories, you know, to, to it's a it's a um, yeah, it's a corrective at some level, right? It's to it's to pierce that hyperbole and break the dogma around some of you know some of these other uh, uh, narratives. I suppose one one thing that that I'm curious about then, if, if to some degree though, the the reason, let's just say that the reason why this narrative has become so popular. Is because of a, a kind of general malaise of the employee, right? In corporations. In fact, I saw a meme recently about you know this is a sort of ten things you could do to improve your health, and it was like you know exercise regularly, uh, meditate, you know, eat whole foods, yeah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Don't work for a corporation it was like on the <laughs> list of health advice, right? and there's some truth to that, right? When you look oh, at yeah. the stats. So, is there anything that you discovered about you know? Good management from from that perspective, from the perspective of of the well being of the employee. Yeah, I mean your 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 meme certainly there, there, there's a kernel of truth. You know, it it does reflect attitudes that people have now. And again, this is not entirely new. As we point out in the book, the these sort of uh, more modern discussions of the bossless company 
really emerged out of the, you know, sort of empowerment movement of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, you know, starting with the civil rights movement and then, you know, the, you know, hippie culture of the mm. 60s, 70s. I mean, these were hippie companies founded by hippies, right, who wanted to get away from the power structures and the the, the traditions and the man so-called. And yeah, nobody wants to go back to, you know, the, the kind of a world where you feel like you really don't have the kind of freedom that you need to, uh, you, you know, to, to, to thrive. Um, sorry, could you could you repeat the second? But the question, the question, question really is, you know, if we if if we take the yeah, and, and I certainly I've I've read certain statistics that suggest you know that depression and you know dissatisfaction, oh, yeah, well, work the, and so on, yeah. right? There, there seems to to me there seems to be a kind of truth in the statement that you know we are experiencing a, a you know a malaise at work, right? Yes. You know, people are just not as happy at work today as they were 20, 30 years ago. Now, you know, from your research, is there anything that you've discovered in terms of management traits yes. that, that, that address that? Yes. And I wouldn't call it uh, management traits necessarily, but sort of managerial practices. Practices, perhaps that's a better and, word. Yeah. Yes. So, so we, we frame this in terms of, again, sort of classic questions of organizational design. So, you know, uh, when is it okay to override a decision of my employee, right? In what manner do I provide feedback and coaching so that my employees r- retain autonomy and they have an appropriate amount of responsibility, but not too much, right? How do I decide which tasks to delegate, which tasks to retain, you know, at the at the level of senior management? How do I evaluate employee performance so that people are being fairly rewarded for their successes and not, you know, unduly penalized for mistakes. So these are really classic questions of management and, you know, how you implement a particular organizational structure. So absolutely, there's a lot of heavy-handed poor management in corporations, and not even in corporations, even in smaller companies. Um, You know, if you think life working for a big company is dehumanizing, Plenty of people will describe their startup experience as being dehumanizing as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. people are people, whether they're in big organizations or small ones. So, right, what we're trying, the, the practical advice we're trying to give managers is number one, be aware of the trade offs from using different, you know, instruments of control. For example, you know, delegating a lot of authority will give workers more latitude and will allow them to take advantage of their their knowledge, their expertise. It can be be empowering from a motivational standpoint, but recognize that that comes at a a cost that maybe the different employees will, you know, what they're doing doesn't, doesn't coordinate well. You may have a loss of coordination. There may be a loss of control that in some circumstances may be detrimental to the organization. So, you know, understand that, again, like with compensation, strong performance-based pay, commissions, high commission rates, and so forth, peace rates, as they call them in the literature, uh, encourage more effort, but can also be stressful. Uh, They can also encourage employees to overlook other margins, you know, trying to produce, trying to generate a lot of sales volume, but but neglecting post-sale customer support, right? So. You know, whenever you push one button to get a boost on one particular margin, there may be a drawback and that you're Mm. losing something on another margin. So first, understand these trade-offs really well. And second, think about how do the pros and cons play out in your specific context? So again, if we're, you know, like the the example with with, uh, um, uh, the Finnish company, right? If we're operating in a small number of countries, and and operations are highly country specific. There's really little need for a consistent user experience across countries. Then the drawbacks of decentralization are not that important, right? The mm. drawbacks are small, and the advantages, as we just described them, are massive. So of course it makes sense to embrace that kind of structure. But in another, you know, as we need more global coordination, as we scale globally, or we want to de- deliver a more consistent customer experience across locales, then we start to see the pros and cons differently. The trade-off comes out a different way, and we want to take some of that authority back. 
Now, obviously, there are baseline characteristics from an HR and you know personnel psychology point of view that that need to be taken into consideration. You know, employees value transparency. They want to know that the rules are being enforced fairly. They want to know what the rules are, right? They want to know that they they want to feel valued. They want to feel important. Uh, part of what our argument is, you know, we think there's this sort of mistaken idea that exercising authority necessarily compromises, you know, human dignity and, and it looks arbitrary from the point of view of employees. Well, it only looks arbitrary if it is arbitrary, yeah. right? If there are clear and consistent rules, you know, here are the circumstances under which we need to step in and, and reverse some employee decision, but only under those circumstances. Uh, and hey, this is one of them. Here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. You may you may disagree, but we have a good reason, and and you know we're going to make sure that we're all on the same page, as opposed to arbitrary, you know, uh, boom, you know we've just we've just you know we've just taken away your 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 project or whatever with no explanation, and and making you feel as if this has been a horrible mistake on your part. I mean, a well exercised manager managerial authority is. You know, can be uplifting and 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 humanizing and empowering if it's done with transparency and you know so-called procedural justice and so forth. So the second half of the book, we do try to offer you know very pragmatic, practical sort of guidance along these lines. Yeah, uh, and and yeah, that that makes uh, that chimes with these. So good management, good leadership, you know, dignity of the of the individual, being transparent. These things. Uh, these things help to have a, hum a humane environment and bureaucracy isn't necessarily dehumanizing. I suppose that's yeah, the point you you're know, making, right? Richard, yeah, I just wonder if if each of us, you know, it, when we reflect back on our own experiences in different situations, you know, from school, the household, places where we've worked, other organizations we've been a part of, and we think about, you know, the best leaders that you worked with, the best bosses, the worst leaders, the worst bosses, I suspect it's not always the case that the worst bosses were the ones who were the most active and the best bosses were the ones that you never saw. Right? I mean, some, yeah. some of us have been in experiences where we, we got really good leadership, you know, which included strong coaching, mentoring, a lot of guidance, you know, disputes when they came up were resolved with the help of senior leadership. And and sometimes you know benign neglect isn't so benign, right? We probably can think of bad bosses that we never saw, and they rarely showed up. But when they did show up, they did something we didn't like. So I, 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 again, that to me that signals the sort of subtlety and nuance that sometimes what we regard as our best work experiences, where we really felt important and valued, were also ones where leadership was actually quite strong. So yeah. to, to me. Cuts against the grain of one aspect of the of the narrative we've been dis we've been discussing. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just thinking of Gary Hamill's book and his you know that that idea of the recovering bureaucrat, right? And he yeah. sort of he lays well, out. Look, we all like to pick on bureaucrats. Don't get me wrong; I certainly do it in my job. You know, I tell plenty of jokes about the dean. You know, my boss. Uh, I think that's just part of human nature. But again, if we go beyond the sort of superficiality. Of those kind of attitudes, and you know, I, I think the story is probably a little bit more complicated. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, yeah, thank you so much. Um, this has been a, you know, a a welcome, yeah, corrective in a sense for me. You know, <laughs> reading this book and hearing your story, and uh, it, you know, it makes uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. I think it, um, you know, you're very nuanced in your argument, and and what you haven't done, which I think is great, is it's almost the. the, the Commit the same sin, but in the opposite direction, right? You've you've said, yeah. Uh, and, and Richard, I want to I want to I, I want to be sure and clarify before we go off the air. You know, I'm a great admirer of the companies that we're talking about and their visionary founders and leaders, and and a lot of the other experts and authors who have written about these companies. I mean, it's great stuff. And I, you know, I'm, uh, you know, to the the quote attributed to Chairman Mao, you know it's better to let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, if I were in charge of the economy or an industry, you know, I would not want to impose one model on anybody. I certainly wouldn't impose hierarchy. I, I say, let, let people experiment, let competition help us to sort out which 
kinds of structures work best in particular circumstances. There obviously is a place for highly flat organizations. Some of them are really great. It's just, again, that it, that model may not be the best for everyone in all circumstances. Yeah, except, except the trade-offs that have come with this, except that certain personality types are going to be more attracted or less attracted to certain structures. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of cool for, for, for nuance and critical thinking. And yeah, it's a, thank you. Exactly. So uh, thank you thank for writing you very the book. Much for, thank you. Yeah, thanks on. for your questions. And uh, thanks for a great, uh, very enlightening discussion. Brilliant. Okay. Well, once again, for those, we'll put, we'll put a link in the show notes, but it's uh, Why Managers uh, Matter by you and, and your co-author, Nikolai Foss. Right? Uh, so uh, yes, uh, this, has been, this, this has been awesome. And we'll put a link. You've got a website as well, right? I do. Yeah, sure. So do you want to call it out just for people who are listening? And- yeah. I mean, actually, the easiest way is I've just got a, a, a redirect for my name. If you just type in my name, it's Peter. My middle initial is G. PeterGKlein.com will redirect to my university website, which has a clunky a URL. You can also just Google search. I mean, I'm happy to say that if you Google search Peter Klein, it's K-L-E-I-N. I'm usually the first person uh, who comes up, so I shouldn't be too hard to find. Right. Okay. Thanks, again. Thanks once again. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.